Hello there, Booktube. My name is Daniel. Welcome back to my channel, Guilty Feet. Yeah, baby, I've got no rhythm. And today I'm going to do a, a review of a book that I finished last night, which is The Fraud by Zadie Smith. This is Smith's uh, sixth novel, and I know this because I have all the others here. So just to, to uh, uh, establish my bona fides vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Zadie Smith, uh, um, White Teeth, uh, her first novel, uh, published in around about 2000, which I read at the time. Second novel, The Autograph Man, uh, uh, which isn't great, but uh, uh, um, I bought this in uh, November 2002. Uh, then you've got her third novel, um, On Beauty, which I think I've said before might uh, is probably her best, uh, um, maybe, uh, and maybe The Fraud is now. Uh, um, like that very much, bought this in 2005. Then we've got N.W. This, this, listen, I have an affinity with Zadie Smith, not just because, well, she's she's about five years younger than me uh, um, but uh, um, she's based very much in northwest London I grew up in northwest London okay she's talking more about Kilburn which is a little further into London than where I am but Kilburn was a 10 minute drive straight down the Edgware Road uh, from where I grew up uh, um, and uh, uh, so you know when she talks about NW NW is my home territory and the fraud is also very much based in this northwest part of London uh, um, so that was N.W. I bought this in 2012, uh, and then her most recent novel was uh, Swing Time, uh, which I got from the Book of the Month Club for the, the brief year that I was a member, uh, and that's from December 2016. I've also got uh, a couple of short stories here, Martha and uh, Hanwell. Uh, um, I got her collection of essays that she put out during the pandemic, Intimations, and I've got this collection of short stories which I really didn't love, uh, um, called Grand Union, and there's a, a, a couple of books of essays that I would like to get hold of, um, feel free, I think. So I've read a fair bit of Smith, and now we come to her uh, most recent release, uh, um, The Fraud. I, I absolutely love this. Um, you know, people make a big deal about it. it's her first historical novel. I never really, uh, um, you know, in, early in my reading career, I never really distinguished between fiction and historical fiction. I read books, and sometimes the people I wrote wrote books about the past, and sometimes they read about the present. You know, the early things that I read were things like Anti Burgess. So he wrote A Clockwork Orange, which is in the future, and then he wrote uh, a book about um, Shakespeare, and he wrote Earthly Powers, which is set in the present, but it goes back 50, 60 years in time. I, I never really said, oh, I read historical fiction, or I don't read historical fiction. So uh, um, I think it's a bit of a fuss over nothing, but I guess if that's interesting to you, this is uh, set uh, in sort of, well, it, it spans from the sort of 1830s through the 80s, very, very grounded in Victorian times. And it's a very literary novel. Uh, um, it's about a writer, a writer who I've never, I had never heard of, but was a real gentleman called William Ainsworth. Um, it's about his former, his cousin slash lover slash uh, a housekeeper slash, you know, through different stages of womanhood, uh, um, um, our lead character or the main protagonist uh, um, throughout this book is a woman called uh, Eliza. Now, I don't know how, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce her last name, T-O-U-C-H-E-T. So it could be in the vernacular as Touch It, uh, or it could be as uh, a Charles Dickens, who is a character who appears regularly, uh, um, often makes a joke about Touche. Uh, uh, I am not wasn't entirely sure, maybe I missed it, and I've tried, been looking for Zadie Smith talking about the book, uh, um, and she talks about all the other characters except Eliza. So uh, uh, I'll call her Eliza for now, and I'm not sure if it's Touche or Touch It. Um, and she appears all the way through. We meet her as a young widow, uh, um, going to live with William Ainsworth, who is a published novelist, and I say the word published rather than celebrated, uh, um, but he was a fairly prolific Victorian novelist. And, and this, again, I had to wait till I finished the book. I, I assumed he was a made-up character. I know that Dickens is real. I know that uh, um, um, Thackeray, who appears in this, is real. I didn't know any other thing. Uh, uh, any of the other writers were real, but turns out they all are. And Ainsworth is a real Victorian writer whose work has been completely lost to time. Uh, I'm sure if you if you looked, you could find them, but I don't think they're printed by Penguin Classics or anything because they weren't classics and they weren't very good. Uh, um, so uh, um, he's a character, and he's uh, uh, um, uh, 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 even when we meet him in this book, he's his whatever success he had, and supposedly his book Sh Jack Shepherd. Uh, which is about an um, outlaw in Britain, a sort of Dick Turpin. Is that the one with Dick Turpin in it, or a Dick Turpin-like character? Anyway, uh, um, seemingly it outsold Oliver Twist for about a week and a half, uh, uh, but beyond that, Dickens is on the rise at the earliest point we meet him, and 
uh, um, uh, towards the end of uh, um, the, the timeline. He's, of course, hugely successful, whereas William Ainsworth um, uh, has never really been that successful and has just managed to hold things together and, and pu publishes a, a literary magazine essentially to print his own stuff um, and doesn't really ever make much money but lives off family money as the, uh, uh, the artistic middle class did for many years. In the back of this we have the story of the fraud. So again, this is a true story. Um, uh, a gentleman, uh, Roger Tichborne, was uh, uh, reported to have drowned. He was the heir to the Tichborne estate. Um, he was sailing away because uh, at that time he hadn't been the heir. You know, he was the second or third or fourth brother and was never going to inherit. But uh, um, eventually um, he, 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 everyone before him dies and he would have inherited, he would have inherited this massive uh, um, huge amount of money and the huge estate and uh, uh, Tichborne is uh, um, reported to have drowned in a, in, a, in a shipwreck on his way to Australia or whatever. Ah, but comes forward a, a man who claims that he is Roger Tichborne, except he looks nothing like him. He doesn't uh, um, speak with the gentility of a, a high-born uh, nobleman would speak. Um, he doesn't speak in the language that Roger Tichborne uh, um, sp uh, spoke. He's uh, 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 none of the people who knew Tichborne recognize him, except somebody, you know, his mother claimed, it's claimed that his mother, who was, you know, disowned by most of the Tichborne family, recognized it, but then she died, so her testimony is unheard. And there are one or two other people who said, no, this man here, this rough spoken, uh, uh, seeming, seemingly working class, uh, um, enormous, he's also twice the size that, that Tichborne was supposed to have been, he is. Roger Tichborne, and he must uh, uh, be given the chance to inherit. Uh, and he is the titular fraud of this. He's known, he was known in Victorian times as the claimant. He was claiming the Tichborne estate, and he's referred to often in the book as the claimant. And there was, you know, almost irrefutable proof that he was someone else entirely. Uh, um, everything he said was was basically untrue. Uh, and and throughout most of this book, he's on trial, where he keeps repeating these enormous uh, fibs. And the more he does so, the more the working class comes out and says, yes, this is true. And if you don't believe him, you're part of the conspiracy to keep the, the comparison between the story, this true story of the Tichborne claimant and uh, uh, the world we live in today where somebody uh, gets to keep telling lies and the more, the, the, the more crass and absurd the lies, the more his fan base say, yes, He's absolutely the only source of truth available and anyone who says he's lying is part of the conspiracy and, and is against the working man. Somehow, Tichborne, who is highborn and about to have, is supposed to represent the working man. Somehow, a, a gentleman in other parts of the world uh, who inherited uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are supposed to represent the working man. It's you know the the parallels are real. Uh, um, I, I listened to Zadie Smith being interviewed. She said she did not have to work hard to shoehorn anything in. It's all there. Um, so this is you know a great story that she's she's leveraging to tell her uh, tale about. I want to read uh, something from the very beginning. So to, to set the background, so we have William Ainsworth, a, a, a writer uh, um, at the lower, uh, you know, the waning part of his career as Dickens. Is becoming a, Dickens once a contemporary and a friend of his uh, has continued to be successful. Um, he's also at this stage in his life um, is remarried to uh, um, a, quite a, a, a woman who is not of the same class, neither of Eliza, who is, is uh, with, as the new wife comes into the family, Eliza is relegated uh, um, to being the housekeeper, and any of um, um, William Ainsworth's daughters from his first marriage. Uh, uh, who never married and, and seemed to be fairly inconsequential, but he's remarried a woman who can't read and is absolutely the most fervent admirer of the claimant of the fraud. Uh, um, and uh, uh, and this is just a, a um, his wife. So his new wife is called Sarah, and uh, uh, um, they're all out for a ride in a carriage. Um, uh, William Ainsworth, Eliza, Sarah, his wife, and uh, his daughters. Um, whilst considering this interesting tooth, the ladies forgot to direct the driver. They took a wrong turn at the commons, looping through Haywards Heath, and it was in that hamlet, to the collective disbelief of the Ainsworth dependents, that they found themselves rumbling towards a pub called the Pickwick, with a clear illustration of Mr Dickens' jolly character upon its swinging sign. Every woman in the carriage spotted it before William, and, as if with one mind, though without any opportunity, without any opportunity to confer, they now attempted to direct his attention to the opposite window. 
with overlapping talk of the beauty of the Downs, two magpies on a post, a church that might be of some architectural merit, and, in Sarah's case, a Shetland pony doing a gigantic steaming shit, but to no avail. And the rest of the ride was silent as the grave. Uh, uh, yes, he's, he's a, a jolly man, Winnie Ainsworth, but he is bitter about the success of his contemporaries. It's a sort of a beautiful picture of the literary world, uh, I guess, similar to something like Martin Ennis's The Information or other books here, and uh, maybe Andrew something, Andrew Sean Greer's book about uh, uh, less. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things. If you like books about writers, this is, this is definitely a, a great book for you. In amongst all this, this great Victorian romp with these funny literary characters and this bizarre true story of the Tichborne claimant, there is another political uh, level which Zadie Smith, uh, uh, I, I won't say delicately, but brilliantly uh, digs out. And that is, it, again, part of the Tichborne story that this character claiming to be uh, Roger Tichborne, um, the one of the few people that recognise him and says, yes, I knew Roger Tichborne when he was young and I recognise him in this man now, is a chap called Andrew Bogle. Andrew Bogle is a former slave uh, uh, who worked in the plantations in Jamaica um, when uh, um, Britain was fuelled by uh, sugar and cotton uh, um, uh, um, industries uh, that were in essentially managed uh, uh, and populated by slaves. Um, and this narrative of the black Britain, somebody who has escaped slavery, has uh, managed to build some kind of life, but it's still throughout, wherever he goes, is uh, um, on the periphery of society, uh, um, is looked at, not understood. There are some people who won't drink out of the same uh, 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 um, glass that the, the, uh, a black man has used and the just the abject racism of life in Victorian Britain uh, for this man is definitely as well as the history the money that has been uh, um, has arrived in the British middle classes and the British upper classes through the relationship to slavery and this is after William Wilberforce after the abolition of slavery in Britain, uh, which was before the abolition. You know, this is this is all taking place twenty years before the uh, um, and uh, leading up to the American Civil War, where uh, uh, um, slavery was abolished. This has already happened in the UK, and yet this lingering the uh, uh, um, uh, um, sense of everything that is that has wealth, every every. Uh, um, uh, person of wealth in the UK. Every white person in the UK is implicated in the spoils of slavery, in money made from slavery. This is an ugly truth that Smith presents uh, uh, in in just a very clear, a very, uh, it's, it's not even brutal. We, we get to hear at one point we break away from Eliza's point of view and she sits and interviews uh, Bogle and hears about his time on the plantations, his time as a slave, uh, the story of his father and his grandfather who was stolen from Africa and brought to Jamaica. Uh, um, and and then we just learn that even through Eliza's eyes, even the money, the small annuity that she has that keeps her going, that keeps her some level of independence, some sense of her own self, how everything is tainted, how everything is compromised, and how Britain, uh, uh, um, which unlike America in many ways has never faced up to its responsibility for slave trade, how much of Britain in this time was fueled by uh, uh, um, um, slavery. Uh, there's a, a fabulous um, uh, understated scene, uh, conversation, uh, and we're back with, we often, we often revisit all the writers sitting down together, so Thackeray and Dickens and our, our you know, hero, uh, William Ainsworth, um, and there's, they're about to get an argument, and Mrs. Eliza is always there, uh, um, and she's, she breaks up arguments and, and tries to avoid any rancor. Um, and, uh, uh, and in this instance, sensing disaster, she stood, she stood suddenly and proposed a toast to the young queen. Good idea, Mrs. Touche, Mrs. Touchett, to the queen and to the new princess. The, the queen at, uh, at this point is Queen Victoria. Well said, a toast to the young queen and her new princess and to the health and glory of the realm. Better yet, let's sing it. All the literary men, all the literary young men, stood up to face the portrait of Victoria. Flushed with wine, gripping each other's elbows, they sang heartily, heartily, of what Britons never, ever, ever shall be. 
And that's a beautifully constructed line. Uh, uh, and if those of you who don't understand the reference, it's a reference to the song Rule Britannia, which is a song that we sung to the Queen, and uh, uh, starting with Queen Victoria. And Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Britons never, ever shall be slaves. Uh, and so just that beautiful line they sung heartily of what Britons never, ever shall be. This is a writer at the height of her powers. The Fraud is a, just a fantastic novel. It just made me enormously happy uh, um, to read a, a really meaty Zadie Smith novel. This is, you know, 450 pages. It's fantastic. The Fraud is a fantastic story. The uh, uh, Everything about her writing is fantastic. It's funny. It's sharp. It is uh, 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 it does not take its eye off the ball at any point, and I highly recommend The Fraud by Zadie Smith. Thank you. Take care. Bye.